الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it looks like everybody is fasting السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I would like to once again thank the, uh, the Rauda Institute <coughs> for inviting me and all of you and arranging this program and after that iftar. We have some very important issues that I want to discuss and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me the ability and the energy to say it properly insha'Allah ta'ala. And give you the energy to listen, inshallah. You just have to listen with the, with the fasting energy. <clears throat> and apologize, I can't speak Swedish. If I could, I would have spoken in Swedish. But alhamdulillah, you all understand English. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us this great month, Ramadan. What is this month called? Ramadan. See, so because I so that I don't go to sleep, I'm going to keep on asking you questions. Okay, so I need some interaction and some sort of uh, discussion type, but at least interaction with your, you know, gestures and your faces and your responsive uh, res answers. <clears throat> and then I'm going to test at the end as well. This is there's some very important things I want to talk about and understand this month from a deeper and maybe like a very important perspective. Some things you may have heard, but some things, at least one thing you may not have heard, I, I think so. But it's to understand what this whole month and everything relating to this month is about. Allah has given us this amazing month called Ramadan. The correct pronunciation of this month is Ramadan. Some people say Ramadan. It's, not, it's with the fatha of the meme. Ramadan, Al-Mubarak You know, literally, and this is not even my topic, but literally <clears throat> You know what, Ramad, it's from the word Ramad Ramad actually means heat, excessive heat Why was this month called Ramadan? <clears throat> because when, some scholars said that when this name, this month was being named It was very, very hot, so they just called it, it's the time of Ramad Time, time of excessive heat and other commentators and scholars of hadith from the classical times have also added to it that it also refers to the burning mercy of Allah. In this month, Allah's mercy burns away the sins of the believers. And this is why it was called Ramadan, Ramad, because it's excessive heat. Now this month that Allah has granted us is a ni'mah, it's a gift, it's a great gift. But why, why does Allah give us this month? If you look at this month, look out of the window. Does he say Ramadan on the clouds on the sky? Does that building, to last week when it was not Ramadan, did that building look pink different or does it look still the same? Still the same. Does this look still look the same? It's the same. Everything around you is still, still the same. Sun rises and sets Outside Ramadan and in Ramadan. The day comes in Ramadan, outside Ramadan. The night enters outside Ramadan, inside Ramadan. Nothing's changed. The sky doesn't become pink or blue or green. The buildings don't change. The ground doesn't become a bit hot. Nothing like that. I know people try to look for those kind of uh, signs. Oh, tonight is Laylatul Qadr because I saw a shining light in the sky. That was probably an aeroplane light. Maybe another light, who knows, but that's not the, our basis. This is another topic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes gives us some signs here and there, but our deen is not based on those things. You know, some people get excited. In England, they used to open an aubergine and they used to see the name of Allah. And everybody used to get excited. Allah's name written on it. I used to give talks. Our deen is not based on an aubergine. We don't need a sign written Allah in the cloud or in the aubergine to believe in Allah. 
The Quran tells us our iman increases by tilaw of the Quran. We believe in Allah because today Allah might be written in an aubergine, tomorrow Ram, which is the Hindu god, may be written in an orange. They will say it looks like Ram. So our deen is not based on these type of superficial things. If it happens, happens. But people, our deen is based yu'minuna bil ghayb. We believe in Allah through the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it doesn't require these type of things. If it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, our iman is still strong. So this month, some people look for signs here and there. If it's there, there, whatever. But the point is Ramadan is a month that externally, if you look, it looks exactly the same as any other month. Today we are fasting. Today is Saturday, right? Last week, Saturday, we were not fasting. It wasn't Ramadan. Maybe the weather was, uh, is better this week, this Saturday. But it's exactly, it's, it's just everything's the same. Nothing's changed. We've just, in our mind, we're thinking it's Ramadan. Why has this month become so blessed that we fast and we pray and we make dua and we make istighfar and we recite the Quran and we think we are getting so much rewards? The only reason is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said so and he said this month is my month, is attributed to him, that's it. There's nothing else that's changed. Ex- the same example, if you take the house of Allah, Kaaba. Kaaba is a square building built of bricks. There are m- many better externally looking buildings in Sweden. We saw so many buildings on this street. You know, look at the buildings. They look so beautiful. Externally, what is it? It's just walls. There's nothing super extra externally. But why it has become so blessed and our hearts are attached to it and people are coming from all around the globe to just look at the Kaaba and just to touch it only because Allah said, it's my house. Baytullah. Allah attributed to him. So externally, there's nothing in it. It's the attribution towards Allah. Ramadan, Allah said, it's a blessed month and I... There's a lot of mercy of mine in this month. There's rahmah, there's mercy, there's forgiveness. This is the only reason why the month has become very, very sacred. And we should also remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the question might come that why did Allah do that? Or why does Allah do that? Like once, one month in 12 months, Allah says, this is my month. And this is a blessed month. There's a reason for this. And this is the concept of Ramadan. <clears throat> the reason is that not just the month of Ramadan, throughout the year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows, He knows us better than ourselves. Throughout the year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fixes and appoints certain times, days, months, nights for a reason. Remember, it's not only Ramadan. Ramadan will finish. As soon as Ramadan finishes, after a while, the Hajj season will start and Dhul Hijjah will arrive. There's so much blessings. You know, every other, after so a certain period, blessed nights have come. Now do Ibadah in there. And now this night has come. This day has come. Not just days and nights. Even five times a day. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. You know, the, what's the reason behind this? The reason is, that in Islam, the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, the, and the, the, the message that the Messenger sallallahu came with is that Islam is a practical religion. Islam understands, acknowledges the human need and the human need to live in this world. So we had some other faiths and still do like the Catholics who had the understanding or who have the understanding, in order for you to connect with God, you have to divorce the world. You have to separate from the world. You can't marry. You can't, monks can't marry. Nuns don't marry. You can't buy and sell or you can't enjoy food. You can't enjoy life. You can't work. You have to completely detach yourself. Monasticism. You have to go into the jungle. This is called Rahbaniyyah in the Quran. Allah says, وَرَهْبَانِيَّةَ نِبْتَدَعُوهَا 
This is monasticism. We didn't prescribe upon it, upon them. They made it themselves. And there's a hadith that says, لا صرورة في الإسلام Sunan Abi Dawood, which means that there is no leaving of marriage. In Islam, marriage is a sunnah. They felt and think that you, in order to get close to God, you have to just, you know, sexual desire, according to Catholics, it's wrong altogether. There's no right way of sexual desire, fulfilling sexual desire. It's wrong. Book of sins, greed, lust, sexual desire, even in marriage, it's wrong. Whereas Islam has a very balanced understanding. Islam says, look, you don't go to the left sexual desire that you fulfill your sexual desire in any way, shape or form, however, inside marriage, outside marriage, with whoever and whatever. Nowadays it could be male, female, whatever. In whatever format, that's the liberal way of fulfilling your sexual desire. The desire to eat food, there's no unlimited permission given in Islam. The liberal way is eat whatever, however, in whatever way, kill any animal, eat any animal, however you want to eat, you want to eat, just fill, it, fulfill your, just fill your stomach. How you earn, whatever, no problem. On the other hand, you have these people, oh, you can't enjoy food, you can't marry, you have to detach, divorce the world, you have to completely get out of this world, mujahada, struggle, connecting with God is, you can't really live in this world and enjoy the luxuries of this world, you can't work. Islam came with a middle message and the message was that look we live in this world Allah understands us the message that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with was that this is a world you live in this world in this world you have to marry you marry you you get reward for marrying yes extreme fulfilling your desire in a haram way that's wrong but in a halal way marry every prophet that came had a wife if marriage was a bad thing then Prophets wouldn't marry. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولًا مِّن قَبْلِكْ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيَّةً Allah says, every prophet I sent, I made wives for them and children. Only two prophets did not marry. Anyone? Which two prophets? Isa. Isa a.s. And he shall marry when he returns. And? Yahya. Yeah. Yeah. Peace be upon him. Jazakumullah khair. But all the other prophets married. And it's a sunnah. It's actually ibadah. And sexual intercourse is ibadah. There's a hadith of Bukhari that says, وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ sadaqa." One of you engaging in sexual relations with your wife or husband, that's sadaqah, charity. Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. It's not a bad thing, it's not a dirty, filthy thing. A man and a woman, husband, wife, sleeping together in bed, having intimate relationship, they are in, involved, engaged in the act of charity, according to the Sahih hadith of Bukhari. وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ sadaqatun." So Islam acknowledges that. Earning a livelihood, yes, there's an extreme on the left. Earn a livelihood however you want. Cheat, fraud, cheating, deceiving, usurping the wealth of others, you know, getting involved in all sorts of, you know, the riba industry and just, you know, all of this, the monopolies and all of that. That's all wrong. On the other hand, there were these monks and some people, some faith communities, oh, you can't earn money. Islam comes in the middle. Look, we understand you, O oh human being. Allah is saying, Kasbu, the hadith says, Kasbu al-halali faridatun ba'd al-faridah. Earning a livelihood, earning money is a fard after other fara'id, obligations. You are rewarded. Earning a livelihood every day, going to one's job and earning money is not an act of dunya, it's an act of deen. But the intention has to be correct and it has to be in the correct way. You know, I remember once I, um, I was at a university in America, New York, I think last year. So we had a, a talk, the, the students, they arranged a talk. And the talk was, the poster they made, the flyer, the balance between deen and dunya. And they wanted me to come and give them a talk to explain to them, how can we balance our university life dunya against our deen? You know, it's a struggle, balancing. So I saw the poster flyer, I mean, they made it the two weeks before. I let them carry on. Because I wanted to make that as a point that the whole, the title was wrong. So I went and I gave the talk. I still remember St. John's University in New York. I, I went and I gave the talk and I said, before we start, this poster, this title, today's event is balance between deen and dunya. Who said to you that this is dunya and masjid is deen? In the university is deen. Being a doctor is deen. If you do it with the right intention that I'm going to serve the creation of Allah, Studying medicine becomes an act of deen. This understanding that the deen is only in the mosque and 
you know, if you are at the workplace or at the job, that's dunya. That's a wrong understanding. So I said to them that this banner, the balance between deen and, deen and dunya, dunya means worldly activities, is a wrong title. I said to them, you should have changed it to the following title. Balance between one aspect of deen and another aspect of deen. Because there are different aspects of deen. Yeah, praying salah is another type of deen. But working and, and being in your surgery as a doctor, like I will explain right now, is a slightly different type of deen. There, there is a difference. They're both not exactly the same, but they're both aspects of religion, but there's a difference. But I'll come to that, how there's a difference. Different types of ibadah, maqsuda and ghair maqsuda. But the point here I'm making is that our religion, what is the understanding in our religion, Islam? That living in the world is needed. So in order to be a good Muslim, you don't have to detach from the world. You don't have to divorce the world. You don't have to stop eating and drinking and working and marrying and leave, living a livelihood, etc., etc. We have to engage and be involved in the world. We have to live a life. We have to raise children. We have to earn. So, because this is the understanding, when we get involved in that, in that what? All, the, uh, all those worldly activities, so-called worldly badin, like I said, activities, there's a, like I was saying, there's a difference between that type of deen and now the salah and, you know, direct. That's why ibadah is of two types. You know, worshipping Allah is of two types. One is, one are those types of worships which have a direct connection to God, like salah. So salah is a direct type of ibadah maqsuda. Fasting, zakat, hajj, making dua, recitation of the Qur'an, qiyamul layl, taraweeh, tahajjud, istighfar, dhikr, all of this. These are direct forms of deen, worshipping Allah. And the other things like going to your job and opening up your office or being a doctor, all worldly, so-called worldly activities, these are also acts of ibadah, but they are secondary, indirect. This is why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Kasbul al halali faridatun ba'd al Earning a livelihood is a secondary fard after the main fard. So salah and all these things are the main things. But this is also deen, but secondary. Now, Ramadan is, why all these months are given all these times, is because Allah knows that we as believers, when we get busy with our worldly activities, we become distant from Allah. Even though that's supposed to be deen, but we, throughout our life, we are so engrossed in our indirect, you can say dunya, or indirect acts of worship. Like working, earning a livelihood, spending time with the family, sitting with the wife, sitting with the husband, raising children, going for a holiday, taking your children out to the zoo. All of this is deen, but these are indirect forms of deen. And we become distant from the direct forms of connecting to Allah. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every so often wants to give us a small reminder, like a beep. It's a reminder. These reminders, every day five times. Fajr, morning, reminder. Then we go, wake up, we have a shower, now we're on the phone and we're at the office. And five hours we've forgotten Allah. Straight away, dhuhr time. Come back to me. Come and pray dhuhr. Okay, back to Allah, wudu, connect to Allah. After dhuhr, go back. Lunch, working, taking, going to the shop, shops, family, here, there, school, children. You've just forgotten Allah, no problem. Because it's very difficult to always be connected to Allah. But don't forget Allah too much. Asr time comes, doot, reminder. Maghrib time, reminder. Isha time, reminder. Every day, five times, reminder to come back to Allah and connect to Him directly. This is why these times are given. Likewise, these are daily reminders. Also daily reminders, these du'as. You know, the prophetic supplications, du'a that we are given. And it's a very, very, very important sunnah to recite these prophetic supplications. We should make a habit of learning them, memorizing them and their meanings. The real, real benefit is when you know the meanings of these prophetic du'a and supplications. As soon as we wake up, Allah is telling us, as soon as you wake up, don't pick up your iPhone. As soon as you woke up, wake up, don't go on WhatsApp. As soon as you wake up, 
Don't you know, think about your work or job or anything like that. As soon as your eyes open, think about me. What? As soon as our eyes open, what happens? What do we read? Which dua? No, no, the, the, yeah, Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Ahyana Ba'dama Amatana Wa Ilayhi Nushur. You know what the translation of that is? All praise to Allah who gave us life after death. In other words, this is a new day and a new life. I was dead at night. Sleep is a sister of death. The Quran says Allah takes away the souls. Allah yatawaffal anfus hina mawtiha. Wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. Fayumsiku allati qada alihal maut. The ones who Allah has decided that they won't be alive anymore, He, re- he keeps the souls. He doesn't send them back. وَيُرْسِلَ الْأُخْرَى All of us, Allah sent our souls back in the morning. So every morning, your eyes open. Alhamdulillah. All praise for Allah. Allah has given me another day to change myself. Ahyana ba'dama amatana. He gave me life. Am I really alive? Yes, I am. Ba'dama amatana. After I was dead at night. Wa ilayhi nushur. But one day I will definitely go to him and I won't be waking up in this world. Remember Allah straight away. And then straight away, wudu, remembering Allah, fajr, remembering Allah, maybe tilawah of the Quran or dhikr or whatever. This is all remember. So this is the early morning we are remembering Allah. So I was saying all these dua, supplications. And you know all these supplications, they are all at times when there's a change. Like when you're entering, when you're exiting. So like for example, after that, most people go where? After waking up? Into the bathroom. Before wudu, you'll go into the toilet, into the bathroom. When we enter, we say, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuth wal khaba'ith. Make our children memorize these and the translation. You know, I told my son he's run away now. He's, 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 but uh, when he was about four or five years, I would have asked him his translation of the duas. The, in his words. And even my daughter, I've, I've told her, she, uh, she's learned it. So when she goes, she'll read, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubut al Oh Allah, please, there's a lot of boys, girls, shaitan in this toilet. Please save me from them. <laughs> that's the meaning, but that's the ch- childish translation. After we come back out, we exit again. So whilst we're inside, then we exit. Ghufranak. Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba annil adha wa'afani All praise to Allah who removed all the you know, uh, filth from my stomach gave me well-being You know this, these prophetic du'as are so amazing, unique Scholars have written books And actually I want to do a course on this Go through each one We need at least 25 minutes to understand Each one has oceans of meanings like half an hour on each dua, so many deep hidden meanings. This dua is saying that we're thanking Allah that, you know what, if I couldn't go to the toilet, to the bathroom, and you know, subhanAllah, this, you know, the thought is that we at night, we ate everything. All the kebabs and burgers and the chicken and, you know, the meat and everything and just ate the bones as well and who cares, everything and went to sleep. <sighs> Snoring away for seven hours. But we don't realize for seven hours Allah's machine is working in our stomach. We're just relaxing. Allah says, you don't worry. My slaves, you just go to sleep. Just wake up fajr, that's it. But for seven hours, won't disturb you whilst there's a massive night shift taking place in your stomach. But it won't disturb you, don't worry. You can just relax. Just do one thing, just wake up for fajr. For seven hours, don't worry. No one will disturb you. But there's people in your stomach... There's protein being made from the food that you ate at night. Blood is being produced from the food that was made. All sorts of things are happening in your stomach and things are happening. And whatever's bad for your stomach, the residue that's all being, you know, sifted to one side. As soon as you wake up in the morning, go and just empty that out. If that doesn't come out, you will die. That's why some people who can't, then they have to have a bag. It's a ni'mah. This just one ni'mah of Allah go, being able to go to the bathroom is such a ni'mah that we could do sujood to Allah for 200 years. That's how great ni'mah this is. But we don't think. These du'as are to make us think that we come back. Ghufranak. Alhamdulillahi alladhi adhaba. Anil adha. 
you know, the translation again, the childish translation is, oh Allah, thank you for, you know, taking everything out, dirty things from my stomach. Otherwise, my dad would have to take me to hospital. Because if you can't, you can you end up in hospital. So, and then when you sit in the car, when you come out, when you, when you, you know, before sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, has given us throughout, during the day, all these different du'as. The du'a before, what's the du'a? When you sit in the car, there's a du'a as well. Read the du'a, subhanallah. No, let me ask him, yeah, go on. Subhanallah. Finish it off. Then, just finish it. Wa inna ila rabbina lamunqalibun. Even that with meanings. Okay, so the point I was making that throughout our lives, because Allah has allowed us to engage in the world, to buy, to sell, to work, to earn a livelihood, to marry, to, to have children, to have a family, to do everything in life, but every so often, five times a day, reminder. Don't go too far away from me, connect with me. Also during the, every single day, when you go into the toilet, dua. When you come out, dua. When you entering the masjid, dua, supplication. When you exit the masjid, supplication. When you're traveling, supplication. Before going to sleep, all these times, these are all reminders. So these are daily reminders. And then we have weekly reminders. Weekly reminders, Friday. Every Friday, connect to Allah. That's a weekly reminder. And then we have this Ramadan as a yearly reminder. Maybe monthly reminders as well. Three times fasting, 13th, 14th, 15th of every month. That's like a monthly reminder. And then the yearly reminder. And then the, you know, the uh, Dhul Hijjah reminder, Hajj reminder. So these throughout the year, Allah has given us all these reminders to connect with Him. And the greatest reminder is a yearly service once a year, one full month of servicing your Iman. Is a reminder. And this is why Ramadan is basically, like I said, in Islam, we don't have this Rahbaniya, we, we don't have this monasticism, you know, the monks and the Catholics had. But in Islam, this Ramadan is a one month taster, slight flavor taster of that Rahbaniya. Still not full Rahbaniya. We can still work. We can still, we should still work and we can still do all of this, but it's like a taster. This is why some of the early scholars, you know what they used to do? They used to take the whole, they used to prepare Ramadan from before. They used to say, okay, one whole month I'm not working. I'm just going to... This is what i'tikaf is. And from the full month, last 10 days is the full taster. And i'tikaf, you know the last 10 nights and 10 days people observe, i'tikaf is basically completely detaching yourself from the dunya. From even your family. This is why only talk to your family only if there's a need in i'tikaf. You can't do i'tikaf with an iPhone. That's the, defeating the purpose. I'tikafa, i'tikifu means I am gone. That's it. I've attached myself to God in the masjid. No, not talking only if there's needed. Not eating too much. It's, it's a bit of taste of that monasticism, the rahbaniya that the monks and the nuns had and the, you know, the Catholics had. So this is what, this is the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when uh, last 10 nights he used to enter, shadd al-mi'zar wa ayqadha ahlahu. He used to stay away from his wife, from his wives. He never used to engage in intimate relations, even at nights. This is a 10 nights of completely devoting to God, connecting to Allah. So in Ramadan, we have a bit of taster. Normally, staying away from your husband or wife, sexual relations is wrong. And if you're not fulfilling their right, it's sinful, it's haram, whether it's your wife's right or your husband's right, generally, without an excuse. So if that's normally wrong, but in Ramadan, during the day fast, we can't. And during the night, it's permissible. In the beginning of Islam, even during the nights, it wasn't allowed. You know, to be intimate at night with your spouse was not allowed in the beginning of Islam. Then Allah allowed it later. فَالْآنَ But someone who's observing i'tikaf, they can't, even in the night. Normally, I just said it's ibadah. The hadith of Sahih Bukhari said sexual relations is sadaqah. But in i'tikaf, now, no. Because, yes, normally it's ibadah, but this is, it's a secondary type of ibadah. Ramadan, you're connecting with the, the first type of you know, ibadah. Like, completely go and connect yourself with Allah. So this is the whole like, kind of concept. To connect with Allah, Allah is giving us daily, weekly, monthly, 
yearly reminders to come back to him but the rest of the time allowing us to no problem just live in the world and enjoy the world in a halal way now the question is that how do we connect to Allah in Ramadan so we have so many different types of worships that Allah has given us in this month have you understood this part so much uh, uh, so far this much okay this kind of this is just like an intro to the concept okay I want all of these things in your mind and I'm going to do a test at the end written test yes no just joking um, how do these various acts of worship in Ramadan because we've understood now Ramadan is a month to connect to Allah that it's, it's a month to connect to Allah so how do these various worships connect us to God? The different things we do in Ramadan are, for example, the, what's the main thing we are doing? Fasting. Okay. Fasting, the question is, okay, Allah has given us a month, reminder, connect to Him, fast. How does fast? There's actually many other reasons for fasting which I will mention just later on. But the point here is that how does fasting connect to Allah? Because this is the question. How does fasting connect a person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because we ascertained and we understood that the objective is to connect to Allah. How fasting connects to Allah is in this way That fasting is totally based on submission This is one of the maqasid I'm going to talk about four, five, four other reasons of fasting But that will come later on under another context But here, just the first Because it's in this context One of the reasons we fast is submission What does submission mean? Islam means submission I talked about this in the afternoon today Islam means submission so one of the reasons or one of the meanings behind fasting is that we fast, we stop eating because Allah has told us to stop eating. We are building a connection with Allah through slavehood. We are slaves. This is really, really important. You know, brothers and sisters, we live in a time where nobody wants to listen to anyone these days. And no problem. But we're, you know, we are the way we are created. I mean, I've also been born in the West and, you know, we, the way... Humans, are big, beings have become, we've, number one, one problem is we've become very sensitive, very attention seekers. Social media has made us a big time attention seekers. Every man and woman is seeking attention through different ways. So this is, a, I mean, this is with research and medical evidence on this as well, that the, the seeking of attention problem has become massive in the world. Num, num, the first one was what? We, we, what did I say? Uh, seeking attention? Sorry? Yeah, very sensitive, very sensitive. You know, just, and the media and, and the, our culture around us has made us, you can't say, like there was once, uh, there was a, um, so, you know, the, I'm just using this, but there was an English white man once, was, like I knew him as a friend, non-Muslim, he was talking to me, he said, you know what, today, if you're a white English man, I'd say, you have to be so careful. You can't, you have to be careful because you might use a word that women might take sensitive. You might say something that the black people will take sensitive. You might say there's something else Asians will take sensitive. You just he was saying that, but maybe even there everyone's sensitive. You can't just say anything. Anything is like something sexist, something uh, you know uh, this or that. Everyone's offended very easily. You know sometimes we need to grow a bit of skin. You know it's okay. It's so I'm not saying people should abuse and swear and slander but some things in the olden times were just like normal it was like it was part and parcel of language like you know you know so sensitive someone sometimes talks to me sorry did i offend you like i don't know this like did I, so what kind of food do you you know asians eat oh is, is that a racist no it's not racist don't worry it's okay so anyway that's not my topic but one of the things is that what's happened is that a lot of people have stopped being obedient like children have stopped being obedient to parents students have be stopped being obedient to teachers the respect towards elders in our community has really gone 
the whole generation has changed. Respect towards parents, towards elders, towards teachers, towards people of community, elder people. Younger generation don't have that. And the reason is this obedience thing, that submission and ob sub being submiss submissive, it's like everyone has an ego. No, who are you to tell me? Like, I can't be controlled. Who are you to tell me? I have hundreds of emails on a weekly basis of problems between parents and children and husband and wife. Who are you to tell me? Now, there's rules, of course, but even marriages are breaking down. I'm not saying anyone should control anyone, but sometimes small, small things like some wife saying, my husband told me, but is he controlling me? Like, why is he, why is he telling me this? It's like, relax, it's, it's okay, just don't worry. Or sometimes even husbands do that. It's like everyone has this ego thing. Islam, I'm not saying Islam is saying that you should be submissive to it, but the whole meaning of the religion of Islam is submission. Submit to God. We are slaves of Allah. Allah is our Malik, our Khalik, our Creator. We are basically, Abd means we are his slaves. We are a slave. This is what Abdiya means. Ubudiya, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Abdullah. Subhanalladhi asara bi abdihi, before he was a Rasul. Controlled, we are controlled by God. We are subject to what he says. It's like, you know, if there's a master and he has a slave, go and do this, go and do that, go and do this, go and do that. This is what we are. Our salah has to be, Allah is saying, bow down, okay, bow down, stand up. Samiya Go in sujood. Okay, Allah. Like, you are controlling us. Until we don't have that connection with God, we can't be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm talking about Allah. I'm not talking about slavehood to human beings. But then if Allah tells us that certain human beings, not slavehood, but there needs to be some respect or obedience, then because God has said. So with parents, you have, we have to respect and obey our parents. Because why? The one who controls us has told us, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ Look after your parents, be nice to your parents, obey your parents, treat them with respect. It's because he has said. If he hadn't said, then no. Because we are obedient ultimately to only God, and then if God tells us, oh, listen to this person, respect that person. Okay, you're saying it, then yes. If you're saying no, then I won't. So our ultimate slavehood is with Allah. The whole of Islam deen is based on ubudiyah. Ubudiyah means whether I like to do something or I don't like to do something. Because God, my creator, my khaliq, my malik, the Rahman, the Rahim, he has told me whether I feel like doing it, whether it's difficult, whether it's hard, whether it's tasty, whether it's pleasurable, whether it's enjoyable, I will still do it. Whether I, also, whether I understand the wisdom behind it or not, I will still do it. This is another problem today. Until I don't understand the rationale, the wisdom of why God has said this, why is this in Islam? Yeah, first find out if it's definitely in Islam. People can find that out. Is it really from Quran and Hadith and authentic and this and that? That's no problem. But we know that it's in Islam. Until I don't get it in my brain, I will not accept it. This is not a budiyah. This is like, you know, if, if I was like a boss... And you know, I had two people, I won't say, but two people working for me. And I had some guests coming. I, I had one person, okay, you're working for me, right? And I had three guests that come to see me. I'm the boss, and you're, you're working for me, okay? Like in the olden times, they used to be slaves, but now just a worker, okay? And I'm paying you or whatever, but I, you're my worker. I have three guests coming, and I make them sit and we're talking. And then I call you, come here, okay. You'll drink tea, coffee, tea, I'll have some, okay. Can you get 12 cups of tea, please? How many cups of tea? 12. You might ask, the, are you okay? And there's three people here, are like, are you really, 12? You might ask me two, three times whether I'm half, I'm fasting and I'm half sleepy. You will ask, no problem. I say, yeah, I know there's three people here, but I want you to get 12 cups of tea. You say to me, tell me the wisdom, why do you, want 12 cups of tea, unless you explain to me, one, two, three, four, maybe you want me to have one, five, why seven more cups? Give me the rationale behind seven extra cups, otherwise I'm not going. That's basically we, when we talk to Allah. We, if we don't, you don't understand, you don't know, I want to send seven home to my wife because she's got, you know, some people at home that's come. Who, who are you to ask? You don't need to understand. You might get it, you might not get it. This is the relationship we have with Allah. 
all the rules of Sharia, if we understand, great. If we don't understand, problem is in our brain. The wisdom, hikmah, there is a wisdom, hikmah behind everything of deen. So all of Islam is about ubudiyah, submission. Islam means submission. So one of the things with fasting is to teach us this submission. You know, a lot of these ibadat, hajj is full of submission. Do you know, it doesn't does make no sense for someone to go around around the Kaaba seven times. Do you need exercise? I don't need exercise. Do you need exercise? Mm. You do. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it makes sense to you. Maybe not to. Well, I don't need to go seven times round around the Kaaba. I can go round around down here. Why do I have to pay four or five thousand pounds? Take a flight and then go all the way around and just go round and round and then go Safa, Marwa, Sa'i. Like, why do I have to do that? I can just go on this street down here, up and down. It's like burn calories here. Why do I need to go? Pell stones? Like, what's, what's that going to do? Take stones and throw it at the wall. Like, what benefit is that doing to the dunya, to the world? Like, what kind of change am I creating in the world? Millions of people are going for Hajj. Because Hajj is a ibadah that is just doesn't make sense. It's to teach submission. You know, the slaughtering. This is why. Because Ibrahim, السلام, when he was ordered to slaughter his son Ismail, didn't make sense. He never asked. Oh Allah, are you okay, God? You're telling me to slaughter my own son? No question. If and then the son as well said to the father, Ya Abat if al ma tu'mar. Oh my father, do whatever you've been told. Don't question. If Allah has said it, there's no questioning. When Allah mentioned this, he called them both. He said, Falamma Aslama, when they both became Muslims. They were prophets, but Muslim means submissive. When they both didn't even question my command to slaughter the father to slaughter his own son. That's when you become a Muslim. So, Hajj is submission. Fasting is also, this is the way to connect to Allah. And like I was saying in the afternoon, it's like, we, it doesn't really make sense. Whether it makes, you know, people like to want to know the benefits of fasting and the medical benefits. There are benefits, but the main point behind fasting is, even if the doctor said it's harmful for you, it's okay, God said it. Whether it's harmful or beneficial, no problem. Those, those, if you find other extra benefits, alhamdulillah, it's, the benefits are lucky that those benefits have been supported by fast. Not the fast is fortunate that it's got some benefits. Not the other way around. Do you understand what I'm saying? These benefits of fasting, yeah, it's benefits. Look, God has also said to fast, so you, the benefits are supported. Not that fast, look, there's so many benefits. So, the whole idea is when Allah says, eat, eat. Don't eat, don't eat. Make sense? Doesn't make sense? Whatever. This is the way to connect to Allah. And I mentioned in the afternoon that there's hadith. One hadith mentions that suhoor, there's a lot of barakah blessings in suhoor and we should take the suhoor meal. Right? We should take the suhoor meal. And the later the suhoor meal is done, the better. Yeah? Suhoor meal, you know, the, it's, there's a lot of barakah. And there's another hadith, ma, la yazalu nas bi khair ma ajalul fitr. We are always in good as long as we hasten with fitr. So, you know, iftar, we should do it straight away. It's actually makruh. You probably know that to delay iftar is makruh. You know, if someone says, you know what, um, uh, today is 9.10, 9.15, 9.25 is iftar time, but you know what, I've, I've fasted to, for Allah till 9.20. Wallah, another one more hour I'll give you until 10.15. It's actually makruh. You're, you're, you, we are what? Destroying our whole fast. It's sinful, it's wrong. Why? The wisdom is that when Allah says eat, then we eat all the way to the end. And that's why it's good to eat till the last minute when fasting time starts. So eating, 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 it's like we're talking to Allah. Allah, you're allowing me to eat? Okay, eat. Two more minutes left? Okay, Allah, I'm eating. Stop! Okay, I stopped. I'm not eating now. Not eating. Maghrib time, Allah says eat, straight away eat. This is why eating... Last minute like before start, first fast starts and eating as soon as iftar comes is to make ourselves a slave. When Allah says stop eating, stop. We're robots before God. It's like someone's controlling. Like stop, walk, right, left, look ahead. Before Allah. Only with Allah. Nobody else. No human beings. This is Islam, is, it takes us out from the worship. People do that with human beings. This is why 
many companions said that this messenger came لِيُخْرِجَنَا min to take us out from the worship of sla- from human beings to the worship of God. Human beings can't control us like this. But Allah controls us. This is Islam that we come out from slavehood and slavery from human beings to slavery and submission to God. This is what Islam is about. So fasting, like the question was, how does fasting connect us to Allah? It connects us through submission. Are you remembering what I said in the beginning, the whole concept? This is the order. I'll need the list at the end. I mentioned the beginning that Allah gives us these certain occasions to connect to him because he allows us to live in the world and not be like the Catholics and the monks and the monasteries and not also the liberal way and we need these reminders to connect to him then the question is how do you connect with Allah in Ramadan so number one I mentioned fasting fasting is through submission eat eat don't eat don't eat despite us wanting to eat because Allah has said that's the only reason we don't eat what else do we do in Ramadan Outside fasting. That's why the hadith about fasting, finishing with fasting. li wa ana ajzi bihi. Allah says in Hadith al-Qudsi, fasting is for me and I shall reward the fasting. Because we have left all our desires, food, drink, for the sake of Allah. Okay, fasting. What else do we do in Ramadan? Like second ibadah. Tell me another ibadah. Taraweeh. Qiyamul layl, taraweeh. That's also, salah in itself is the greatest way of connecting before Allah. Mi'raj al-mu'min is the ascension of the believer, any salah. So this salah has been increased because salah itself is the main method of connecting to Allah. The greatest, the hadith says that the, the posture, the position through which a slave is closest to his God is in the state of sujood because that's but we have to pray with that like you know when we pray salah we need to have that khushu and concentrate like when you're in sujood we need to feel and think we're on the ground because it's become so common it's become robotic so we don't realize what we're doing Allah akbar Amin Allah Allah akbar we just we're just thinking like we just sat on another chair and we've just gone this way because we do it regularly I know it's difficult you know if you ask some non-muslim who's never prayed salah or never seen anyone pray salah, you tell him, come here, okay, can you just go down and put your head on the ground? What's what's happening? Okay, what am I doing? Okay, you're putting on the head. Okay, just go there, close your eyes and think uh, about the majesty of this something that's in front of you. You know, the whole thought comes. Because we do it regularly, the thought doesn't come. Khushu in salah means, you know, praying with concentration, like you are... You worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. So when we say Allahu Akbar, we're standing basically, whether, you know, hands here or here, whichever way, both are from the Sunnah. But, you know, standing before Allah. Or sometimes even the Maliki way is this way, there's hadith for that as well, it's not a problem anyway. But standing before Allah, you're standing like this. Like, you know, we've got our hands folded like this. You know, before we stand before someone, say, okay, what are you telling me? Okay. That's the way of standing before Allah. That's khushu of his salah. Thinking that I am before Allah, okay. And then knowing the meanings, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Try to understand the meanings of these short surahs. Ruku' Subhana Rabbi al Azim. You think, what, why are we saying Subhana Rabbi al Azim and Sujood Subhana Rabbi al A'la? What's the difference between al Azim and al A'la? A'la. We say Subhana Rabbi Al A'la in sujood because that's the most adna state. The lowest state is adna. So we talk about Allah's ulu, Allah's you know, loftiness, His greatness, His majesty. So, and then every position of salah. So, sujood, you know, with this thought, concentration, it's difficult. It's probably the most difficult thing. It's very, very difficult, but it takes time. Maybe you get 10% concentrated. It might take another 2-3 years, 20% concentrated. It might take another 4-5 years, 30% concentrated. It might take 50 years and you might get 80-90%. Even that's great. But we have to try to say, okay, I want to get this concentration and connection. Salah is an amazing, unique way of connecting to Allah. And that's why this has been increased in Ramadan. There's more, 20 rak'ah or whatever rak'ah, or 24 rak'ah, or 18 rak'ah, or 40 or 8 or whatever. Pray, but pray with concentration. 
Don't pray and argue about it. That how many rak'ah did you pray? Like, it's better that you just pray how much you want to pray with concentration rather than praying so much without concentration and arguing about it. So this is Qiyamul Layl. What else do we do? Read Quran. Quran. Yeah, recitation of the Quran has a rest, Quran recitation has a strong connection with the month of Ramadan and has a strong connection with connecting with Allah. Imagine we are reciting the words of Allah. How else can you get you know connected to Allah? You're reading His words, Kalamullah. This is an amazing way of connecting to Allah. You know, you're reading someone's email that you like. You know, so you're reading it three, four times. Someone you really like, and the email, and the paragraph, or did you use this word? And sometimes, you know, someone you... you know, it happens to a lot of people sometimes in uh, you know, relationships or marriage, but sometimes someone you adore and respect. Like there's someone you really love and respect. There's one of my teachers that I really look up to. Whenever he sends me a message or something, I listen to it three times. Like, did he use that word, or is he using that word? If it's a voice note, I listen to it at least three times, sometimes four or five times. If it's a message, I'll just really read it because, you know, I love him as a teacher. So I, I go through it two, three, four times. So with that sort of connection, reciting the book of Allah. And you know, this is why, how does Quran connect you to Allah? Again, just like Salah, there's khushu, etc. There's khushu also in Quran recitation. And books have been written on how to recite the book of Allah. Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah wa radiya anhu, great imam, we mentioned him many times today. He's a unique scholar, one of my favorite, favorite, all-time top scholars of the Muslim ummah. Imam al-Nawawi, I'm sure many of you have heard of, just unique, amazing, you know, scholar of Islam, a great scholar of hadith, muhaddith, faqih, a jurist of the Shafi'i madhab, but... His, his teachings are so balanced and so deep and so comprehensive and so gentle and so, you know, overwhelming. One of the great scholars. He's written many, many, many books. We talked about his Arba'in Nawawi, etc., etc., Riyadh Salihin. But he has a really good book. He wrote a special book on how to recite the Quran. At-Tibyan fi adabi hamalat al-Quran. It's actually been translated into English as well by somebody called Sheikh Musa Faba. You heard of him? Okay. He's a friend of mine. We used to study together in Syria. He translated this a long time ago. I think new editions come out as well. Etiquettes of reciting the Quran. When to read. What are the best times to read. When make wudu in the direction of the Qibla. Try to read in the masjid. Morning time after Fajr. Inna Quran al-Fajri kana mashhuda. Uh, and then also thinking and reflecting, etc. You know, the weight that Salaf, the early Muslims used to read was they used to ponder. When Allah said, ya yuh, says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe. They think, okay, oh Allah, alhamdulillah, I am of the believers. Tell me, what are you telling me? You're talking to me. Then they, Uzkuru Allah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah excessively, make dhikr of Allah. Then they'll think, okay, Allah, I need to do this. They might do one dhikr and then say, if they're doing something that Allah has commanded them, they will thank Allah. If they're not doing it, then they say, Astaghfirullah, Allah, make a promise, I'm going to do this now. If there's ayat of Jannah and paradise, they will thank Allah and, and make dua to enter paradise. If there's punishments, ayat of punishment, verses of punishment, they'll seek protection and refuge of Allah. They'll shed tears on certain verses. They'll, they'll show in happiness on certain verses. With concentration, Reciting the book of Allah increases iman and increases connection with Allah. So even in Quran recitation, it has to be with the heart, with the connection. And then I also said, what else do we do? Is i'tikaf in Ramadan. Yes? And I've already explained that how Ramadan connects, uh, sorry, how i'tikaf connects us to God. Because the point I'm making here, how all these different forms of worship connect us to God. So, Fasting I've mentioned, Tarawi Qiyamul Layl Salah, Quran, uh, Quran, Dua as well. Dua is like you're asking Allah, you know, this is a very strong way to connect to Allah. Because Dua is, you know, Dua doesn't require much explanation because we make Dua, we need it ourselves. So normally people always have khushu in Dua. 
because you're saying to Allah, oh Allah, please, I want this, I want this, and you know, so we want it. So we are human beings, you know, slaves, so we will be connected. And i'tikaf is also in Ramadan, where we are detaching the world, completely separating from the world, even from the family, everybody, we are going in, into the house of Allah in the masjid. Also, the sisters can also make i'tikaf in the masjid, but also at home. The brothers can't do that. They have to only do it in the masjid. It's not allowed at home. The sunnah i'tikaf, the last ten, maybe nafil one, maybe. But sisters can also designate a place at home. So if you have like a place, a musalla at home, and you should have a musalla inside the home. Every home should have a musalla. It doesn't have to be a big musalla. You can have a designated place. It's actually recommended. You know, the, the way we live is like we pray fajr in the bathroom and, you know, dhuhr in the corridor and asr in the kitchen and maghrib in, you know, in the bedroom and isha in, you know, the attic. You know, and tarawih next to the stove and, you know, maghrib is definitely next to the, you know, all the pastries. So it's good to appoint a certain place at the home where anyone who wants to offer prayer salah they go there. So if you have it in the room, like a small corner place, there's a musalla there, there's a prayer mat there, there's some mushaf Quran there, things like that. Anyone, son, daughter, anyone wants to go, okay, I'm going to pray my salah there. So it's, it's, if you have a full room, it's great if you've got a big house. If you don't have a big house, then it's just a small place. Whoever wants to, you know, from the family, wants to go and recite some Quran or read some salah, go there. I'm going to the musalla, in the, in the house. So that would be the designated i'tikaf place for the sisters. And then she'll detach herself from the family, connect herself to Allah, and that's it. She'll eat there, she'll just not talk too much with people, just completely all day and night. Dua, istighfar, tilaw of the Qur'an, just connecting to Allah, maybe even just meditation, thinking about Allah. So this is i'tikaf, another way of connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so we've done fasting, and we've done what? Quran, and Taraweeh, Qiyamu Layl, Salah, and I'tikaf. And there's one last one. What's another act that we do? Dhikr is part of, you know, recitation, Quran, etc., Dua, all of that. Zakat? Yeah, charity. Zakat and charity. Not just zakat, but charity. Okay. And this will take me to the second part, which I want to talk about. And that part is also very important, like I'll need a half an hour on that. It's very important. Another way of understanding Ramadan. But let me just finish this zakat off. Or charity. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked in a hadith of Sunan Tirmidhi, Ayyu sadaqati afdal? Which charity is the most virtuous? He said, sadaqatun fi Ramadan. Charity in Ramadan. In a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, he was the most generous. He, the most generous, he was in Ramadan. He was more generous than Mina Rih al Mursala, than a blowing wind. He was very generous in Ramadan. So being generous, not just zakat, but like providing iftar. The hadith says, Man fattara sa'iman kana lahu ajru kana lahu mithl ajr sa'imihi. Whoever provides iftar for someone, he or she will receive the reward of the fasting person min ghayri an yuntaqas min ajrihi shay. Without the fasting person's reward being decreased. So if I gave you something for iftar, I get your reward as well. Imagine if every day, if we provide something, and it doesn't have to be a lot, it can be something, it could be one date. If we gave something and provided something for iftar for someone, after 30 days, we have received the rewards of 60 fasts. Because we get their reward as well. And if they give us, they get, they get 60 as well. So, there's a lot of reward in charity. And everyone knows that. But the question is, how does that connect you to Allah? That's what I'm trying to explain. We all know charity is... But we're talking about Allah's giving us reminders every Day, weekly, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Reminder for what? Going back to him, connecting to him, connecting with him. Yes? Are you, are you with me, everybody? These are, wait, Allah is giving us a, this Ramadan is a yearly reminder to connect. So we, I've explained how fasting connects us to Allah and praying Quran and I'tikaf. 
and uh, recitation of the Quran. Charity, how does that connect us to God? Do you know how charity connects us to God? The reason why charity connects us to God, there's a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, Al-Khalqu Iyalullah Fa'ahabbu al-Khalqi man ahsana ila iyalihi The creation is the family of Allah. Allah loves His creation. So the most beloved to Allah is the one who is good to His creation. The creation of Allah, Allah loves them. It is, the creation is the belonging of Allah. I'll give you an example. If I own something, or you know, like sometimes you have, like I've got my son, yeah, or my daughter, I have children, you have children. Someone's nice to your children, wouldn't you love that person because they're being nice to your children? Something you love, someone comes and gives a gift to your children or to your young ones, be nice to your family, to your people, beloved to you, you will love that person. So the whole of creation is the family of Allah. Allah loves His creation. Allah is saying, if you are good to me, then you will have love for me and I will have love for you directly. So charity is, the reason why charity connects us to Allah is because we are being kind and nice and generous and charitable to something that Allah really adores. You know, there's a, say, there's a story in the olden times. You, everyone's heard of Majnoon and Layla? Yes, let's make it a bit light now. I know it's getting a bit uh, hot and, you know, we need to eat. And this is a bit deep conversation, you know, all these concepts, everything. Heard of Majnoon and Layla? Everyone's heard of Majnoon and Layla. These were, by, by the way, they were not names. Layla wasn't really a name. Layla in Arabic is used... Now people keep Layla as a name, but... Classically, Layla was a term to describe something that people love or like or devour or, or lust after. So dunya was called the Layla. Dunya was called the Layla is because people love the dunya. So people, something that someone lusts for was called Layla. So that story, Majnoon, that wasn't his name. His name was Imra al-Qais. His name wasn't Majnoon. Majnoon means he was mad. He was crazy for the love of this girl, whatever her name was. So she became Layla and he became Majnoon. So every romantic couple, Romeo and Juliet, yes? Like in English as well, we say Romeo and Juliet. So in Arabic, every Romeo and Juliet is Majnoon Layla. So this Majnoon guy, he was mad. He used to go around and touch the house of Layla. Layla never used to, you know, she was very playing hard to get, like they say. You know, she was like, you know, no, no, you can't have me, I'm too good for you. And he was a bit mad for her. And the more she ran away, he ran after her. That's, you know, again, another procedure of the dunya. If, you, if he just left and said, all right, I don't want you, then she might have to come back. This is how human, blings, human beings play a game. The more you run after someone, they run away from you. The more you run after dunya, the dunya runs away from you. The, one, the more you run away from the dunya, it's like a shadow, it'll run after you. You're running after your shadow, you'll never catch it. But if you run away from your shadow, it will just keep on running behind you. So therefore, this is the normal policy of the world. Anyway, that's another topic. So this Majnoon and Layla, he used to go around the house of Layla and go and touch the window and kiss the stone and the, you know, like, kiss the walls of her house because he was in love. Love makes you do crazy things. Like the Hadith says as well, makes you blind and you are me or you some. Blind love. So he used to just go and he used to kiss the walls and the windows of her house. So somebody said to this Majnoon guy, like, what's the benefit? Why are you like touching and kissing and, you know, feeling and touching this building, this house? That's not Layla. So then the, he responded and there's a few lines of poetry. Amurru ala diyari diyari Layla. وَأُقَبِّلُ ذَا الْجِدَارِ وَذَا الْجِدَارَ وَمَا حُبُّ الدِّيَارِ شَغَفْنَ قَلْبِي وَلَكِنْ حُبُّ مَنْ سَكَنَ الدِّيَارَ Very famous lines of poetry. I roam around, أَمُرُّ عَلَى الدِّيَارِ Diyar, Dar, house, Diyari Layla. I go around the house of Layla. أُقَبِّلُ ذَا الْجِدَارِ وَذَا الْجِدَارَ I kiss this wall and I kiss that wall. 
وَمَا حُبُّ الدِّيَارِ شَغَفْنَا قَلْبِي It's not the house that's overcome my heart. It's not the love of the house that's come in my heart. وَلَكِنْ حُبُّ مَنْ سَكَنَ الدِّيَارَ It's the love of the one who lives in the house. Not the house. I don't love the house. But I love the one who lives in the house. This house belongs to someone I love. So now I will kiss the house as well. I fell in love with the house because the house belongs to the one I love. So I love the creation of Allah because it belongs to Allah. I am kind towards the creation of Allah. I am charitable. I am hospitable. I am considerate, compassionate towards the makhluq, the creation of Allah because it belongs to Allah. I have love for Allah and part of my love for Allah, it is impossible for a human being to love Allah and not love his creation. If anyone says, I love Allah, but not his creation, sorry. You're deceived and you're cheating and you know, you're deluded. Impossible. Part of having love for Allah is loving his creation because he loves his creation. And this creation, animals included. When we say creation, I'm not just talking about human beings, I'm not just talking about Muslims, I'm not just talking about Muslim, non-Muslim human beings, I'm not just... Animals, and not even animals, really. Do you know, it includes every creation of Allah. It even includes the mountain down there. It even includes the trees. It even includes the ground. It even includes grass. It even includes vegetation. It includes the air. So we have to love all of this and be gentle towards everything. Being gentle to the Atmosphere is also part of loving the creation of Allah. And then that's another topic, you know, this whole, you know, some people have talks on that and you must have heard of that. You know, being kind to the environment is part of deen. This is why. Why is it part of deen? Because it's the creation of Allah. You know, Islamically, it's actually wrong to, if there's not a need, look, we, ha- we are kind to all of the creation of Allah, but Allah has made us the best. This is the balance. Listen to this carefully. We have to be kind towards all the creation of Allah, but Allah has made us, meaning human beings, ashraful makhluqat, the most noble of the creation. So yes, we are before the animals. We love the animals, we are compassionate, but we have to also understand that we are above the animals. We are not equal to the animals. We are not animals. Animals, Allah has made them secondary to human beings. So, Animals don't do dhabah of us and eat us. We make dhabah of animals and we eat. Chicken doesn't eat. There's no iftar of chicken having iftar today. All the humans have been cooked. Today, humans are doing iftar with chicken being cooked, fish being cooked. The fishes are not having us in iftar. So we have to remember this. Sometimes people go wrong in there. The people who animal rights activists who like to, who are vegetarians and veg, you know, vegans, whatever, whatever, they say, oh, no, no, you can't kill animals and this and that because they've misunderstood. Yes, there has to be a balance. Islam allows us to eat animals, but at the same time, Allah says, remember, you have to have compassion on the creatures. They're not lifeless objects. You can't kill animals like you want. You have to slaughter them in a particular way, in a humane way. You have to cut the veins. You can't sharpen a knife in front of the hadith says, كَتَبَ الْإِحْسَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Even if you slaughter, slaughter with ihsan. So one extreme is someone says, oh, you can't eat any animals. Eating any animal is bad. You're being oppressive. That's one extreme. The other extreme that we find today, even and mostly in Muslim communities, is it doesn't matter. These animals, you know, ride a donkey and slap it and kick it and, you know, ride a horse and just kill an animal and kill a chicken and however you want. And these no compassion towards the creation of Allah. That's a wrong way of eating animals. And today, somebody asked this question as well. That Look, I am a vegetarian or a vegan. I don't want to eat animals. Not because I think it's wrong as a concept. Because that's, if you think like that, then that's an Islamic. So I think Islamically, Allah has allowed us. So I have no problem. But the way the animals are treated and slaughtered today are wrong. It's a wrong way. And that's why I don't eat. That's perfectly fine. Someone can definitely be a vegetarian and say, I don't want to eat any animal because the way they've been slaughtered everywhere in the world, slaughterhouses, it's not done. In, it can't be done. The Sharia ruling is one animal should not be slaughtered in the presence of another. How can that possible be possible unless you do it at home? 
The slaughterhouses want to slaughter 17,000 chicken in a few hours. Because the business, that's how it happens. One animal in front of another animal, not slaughter, how is that even possible? Don't sharpen the knife. There's so many rules of animal slaughter that they are virtually impossible to act upon in this day and age. The animal will still be halal, but it won't be like the pure type of tayyib type of food. Unless it's an organic type of chicken that you've looked after, and then after that, with all the etiquettes, you've slaughtered yourself, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, in an in a Islamic way, with all the etiquettes, and then cooked in a proper way, then it becomes a pure wholesome food. But anyway, so we have to realize that animals are, bef- sorry, the humans are above the animals. So I was saying compassion for the creation of Allah. Compassion for the creation of Allah means animals and human beings and plants and all of this. So this is why in Ramadan, the last ibadah, are you with me? Connecting to Allah through charity is why? Because we are being kind to His creation. And this is why we connect to Allah through that way. Okay? Is that clear? Now, how long is left? The last part I just want to mention and then we'll end inshallah in about 15-20 minutes. The last part. It's a long, long issue, long topic. But connecting to this charity or this uh, being... Okay. Charitable, being compassionate towards the animals, to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This takes us to the next part. This month in the hadith has been called, this is a very important part of this month. You know, this last ibadah. Because we said, fasting connects us to Allah. That's one ibadah, one worship. We said, praying Quran, reciting Quran, offering taraweeh, qiyamu, layl, salah, recitation Quran, itikaf, and charity. But charity is such an important part of this month. You know why it's such, such you know, very important? There's a famous hadith. Many of you have heard this hadith. This is a hadith in Sahih ibn Khuzayma and some other books of hadith. You know the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam on the last Friday of Sha'ban. The last Friday of Sha'ban, just before Ramadan, he gave a sermon, a khutbah. This khutbah, many imams on last Fridays, they actually recite it in the masjids as well. And it's a long one, but I'm not going to go through it. But he gave a khutbah. And he mentions, he was preparing the companions about this month. Okay? And he was preparing them and mentioning a few things. Like you must have, he said, yeah, oh people, the great month has uh, come unto you. Shahrun Azimun Mubarak is a blessed month in it. There's a night better than 1,000 months. Uh, whoever offers optional act, good act of deed, you get the reward of fard outside Ramadan. Whoever performs a fard act, you get the reward of 70 acts, fard acts outside Ramadan. It's a long hadith, etc., etc. In there, he's mentioned about fasting and providing iftar, all these things. But in there, there's one sentence. This is so unique, so amazing. Not even a full sentence. It's like three, four words. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Huwa shahru sabr wa sabru thawabuhu al-jannah wa huwa shahru al-muwasat. He identified the month of Ramadan with two words. He mentioned a lot of things. You know the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he never introduced or identified this month with any other ibadah. He never said this is a month of fasting. It is a month of fasting, but he never said that. Imagine when you want to introduce something, yes, you use like the most important thing, right? This something that has a lot of things, but you say, this is a business, they do business with a lot of things, but this is a gold business, even though they do some other business. So when he was identifying, introducing Ramadan, he never said, this is a month of fasting. Shahru Saum, no. Shahru Taraweeh. 
نو شہر القیام نو شہر القرآن نو شہر الاعتکاب all those things I've just mentioned none of them he said two things شہر الصبر and number two شہر المواسات مواسات is a charity part but I'm coming I'll just come to that in a bit but the first which is really important شہر الصبر this month if, he, if we want to identify and explain and introduce you know brother just introduced me if I stood up here brother, brothers and sisters I want to introduce to you the month of Ramadan the month of Ramadan is a month of sabr that's the introduction if you want to introduce Ramadan to non-Muslims what is Ramadan about brother or oh, mister or oh, Muslim what is Ramadan about Ramadan is a month of patience what does that mean is a month of patience this is what we have to understand and this tells us another two three reasons why we're fasting Ramadan I said one reason was that Allah wanted so this is like a second part so if you want to connect in this way the first part of the talk was I was saying that Allah gives us once a year a month to connect to him yes now this is looking at Ramadan from a different way Ramadan is a month that Allah is giving us a whole month Listen to this carefully, it's very important. Giving us a whole month for us to practice, for us to exercise, for us to train, for us to go through a training of sabr. I'll tell you what sabr is, but first point is this. Ramadan is a month. The first thing I mentioned was to connect to Allah. This hadith is telling us, shahru sabr. This is a month of sabr, which means... Allah says, O oh Muslims, I'm giving you 30 days. 30 days, learn. You know, if you're trying to drive a car, learn, take some lessons. How many lessons do you need to pass your cars? Do you guys drive cars? How many lessons did you take? First test, second test? I passed on my second test. I took about 27 lessons. You know, you, know you have driving lessons. Allah is giving us 30 days, one whole month. Lesson, 30 days, I am giving you training period. After Ramadan finishes, you have to build this quality of sabr in you. This is what Ramadan is for. What is sabr? Many of us think we have a very restricted, limited understanding of sabr. Someone passes away, someone dies, something went wrong. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We think that's sabr. That is sabr, but that's not the only one. That's actually a one third of sabr. The ulama have explained sabr is of three types. Sabr ala ta'a. You know what sabr ala ta'a is? Sabr, basically the meaning of sabr linguistically means to tie something. If I took this phone and tied it against this, it's sabr. So you're tying your soul, you're, it's to control something. So sabr linguistically means doing something that you don't want to do and just building willpower. This is sabr. Building a thick skin. You know people are very sensitive, I said. So this Ramadan is to build a thick skin, sabr. So first type of sabr is sabr ala ta'a, which means that there are certain things in life we have to do. Every day we have to pray fajr. Five times a day we have to pray. It's difficult, it's not easy. You know, waking up for fajr salah, is it easy? No, you wake up, alarm goes, oh, it's so hard. I'm doing sabr. Sabr in waking up and praying, sabr like going against your desire and urge not to pray fajr. You don't want to give in charity. You don't want to recite Quran. You don't want to do all these things which are difficult that takes to, us to Jannah. But just doing sabr, building willpower, controlling the nafs and the soul, and doing it, that's called sabr. That's sabr ala ta'a. The opposite, the second one is sabr anil ma'siyah. That's the opposite. Sabr in staying away from sin. So someone really wants to commit zina. Like that, that guy or that girl, you know, she's like been flirting and so I, I just have to just flirt a bit more and that's it. The kissing will happen and then the boyfriend, girlfriend, it will happen. It's, it's easy. She really wants me. She's giving me all the messages and all the, you know, flirty chattings taking place on WhatsApp or whatever. Or that guy, you know, it's, it's you know, outside marriage. It's so desirable. You want to do it. But Yusuf, salam, Zulekha ran after her, him. You know, the story of Yusuf. Ran after him. He ran to the doors. Allah kept on opening the doors. And he actually 
The Quran says, Hammat bihi wa hamma biha. He was a human. That not to have a desire, that, that's no big deal. The angels don't even feel like doing zina or stealing or robbery or killing or murder or, or eating haram. They're no big deal. That's why we're this creation, human, despite the desire, willpower. Because God has said, I'm not going to do it. Even the prophets had the desire. The Quran says, Yusuf, peace be upon him, had this desire to engage. وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا But his iman was too strong. Like his willpower was too strong. Nothing could move him. So this is a... Sabr means willpower, thick skin, being able to control yourself against the urge to commit sin. Any sin. Could be zina, could be stealing, could be backbiting. Backbiting is a massive sin. You know, one of the easiest sins that people commit is backbiting. And regarding backbiting, there's a hadith that your sin, your fast actually breaks. People vomited in the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, pus and flesh came out. Backbiting meaning talking in the non-presence of other people, something that they dislike. There's only certain times when talking about them may be halal when there's a need. But backbiting is a massive sin. Now the desire, you and your friend, and uh, you know, you're on the phone on WhatsApp, and you're there cooking food for iftar, mashallah, fasting. But whilst cooking, that backbiting, which is worse than zina kind of sin. Oh, do you know that sister? She's like this, and she's like, she's stupid, and she's like this. And do you know what she does? You know, you know. Now it feels good to the heart to talk bad about that someone. But you think, no, no, no. I, I want to talk, but I'm not going to talk. Sabar. Because my God has said, can't talk about someone. I feel like being jealous. No, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to be jealous. I feel like doing bad to someone. I feel like doing this sin. Sabr. This is called sabr anil ma'asiyah. And the third type of sabr is what we know when someone passes away or you know something bad goes or calamity and we say, inna, illa, inna lillahu inna rajun. You know, we exercise patience. That's the third type of sabr. So now, going back to Ramadan, fast, Ramadan is a month of Sabr. Now, how does Ramadan, how is Ramadan a training course for fasting, uh, for, sorry, Sabr? That's the question. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa introduced Ramadan as what? Ramadan is a month of Sabr. Ramadan is a month of Sabr. So, what is the question? Ask me the question. How does he train us? Yes. How does Ramadan train us to become people of Sabr? This is why we fast. During the day, right now, aren't we doing sabr? We really want to eat this. If it wasn't Allah hadn't told us you can't eat, I would have finished it off before you would have come. <laughs> we want to drink, we want to eat. You go in, you've started a fast. During the day, you go inside your house and it's so hot. In the fridge, there is a cold bottle of water. There's no one at home. Your husband's not there. Your wife's not there. Nobody on planet Earth will rec- know that you've... Well, if someone doesn't fast altogether, we're not talking about them. But someone who's a practicing, who has started the fast, it's 3 p.m., 4 p.m., it's so hot. Your throat is dry. Your mouth is dry. There's a cold bottle of water in the fridge. You just have to open it and just take a few sips and put it back and just fill it up with from the tap. Nobody will know. And you can just pretend to be fasting, but none of that will make you open that fridge because you've got that sabr, willpower. Allah said, no, I can't do it. This is the training for sabr. So, Allah is saying, the way in Ramadan, every day you want to eat, you want to drink, you want to engage in relations, there's sabr. And you're controlling, you're building willpower. Why are you doing that? You're not doing it for a joke. You're doing that because after Ramadan finishes for the next 11 months, you need that same willpower to stay away from sins and wake up for Fajr. That's why you're doing it. If you think that I'm just doing it Ramadan eat day and then I'm going back to my life, then there's no point doing it in Ramadan anyway. Like, okay, that doesn't mean don't do it in Ramadan as well. But it's like that. Like, you're doing it. It's like somebody learning how to drive a car for 30 days and then after that just says, okay, I'm just going to crash my car everywhere. It's like that. You're learning how to drive a car. Sabr. Fasting teaches sabr because we're building willpower against things we want to do. Allah is not allowing us halal things in Ramadan so that after Ramadan we save ourselves from haram. That's another way of looking at it. Isn't water halal right now? Right now? No. Right now it's halal. But in 20 minutes water will be halal. Allah has said 
you can't eat and drink halal things during fast. So that after Ramadan, you have willpower to stay away from things which are haram. And the worst part is that if someone does the haram things in Ramadan, that's like crazy. If someone fasts, stays away from food, from chicken, from water, from tea, from milk, these things are halal before Ramadan, they are halal after Ramadan, they are halal after iftar. But during the day, he's fasting or she's fasting but doesn't stay away from backbiting, from swearing, from slandering, from this sin, that sin. It just doesn't make sense that you're, st- you're staying away from water which is halal generally, but something which has never been halal, haram, before Ramadan, after Ramadan, day of Ramadan, night of Ramadan, and we're not staying away from that. So it just defeats the whole purpose of fasting. It's like while someone's taking a driving, you know, training lessons to drive, crashes the car. Do you understand what I'm saying? One, the first situation was somebody, whilst they're taking a driving lesson, they're very careful because they got the instructor, very, very careful. But as soon as they pass, then they just go and just drive however and just crash the car. That's bad as it is. But even worse than that is, you've got your instructor and you said, okay, take a left, take a left, do, and you go and just bang into a wall. Whilst you're taking the te- driving lessons, you just drive however. So that's in Ramadan doing the sins. So that's even worse. And also bad is after Ramadan the sins. So the whole month of Ramadan is basically a month of sabr. This is why Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called this month the month of sabr. And the second thing he said, I'm just two, three minutes on this. He said, the second way how he introduced this month, he said, huwa shahrul muwasat. This is a month of, it's a very difficult word to translate in any language in one word. We can say sympathy, compassion, empathy, kindness, charity, all of this. Muwasat. Muwasat in Arabic, there's actually two, three meanings behind it. But muwasat, this one level of muwasat is that it's a, it refers to having sadness in the heart upon the sadness of others. This is the, the word muasat in Arabic. It's from the word asiya yasa. Someone is saddened because of the sadness of others. So you see a poor person, you think like he doesn't have food. You feel sad as well. This is a level of muasat. So this is why one of the reasons we fast, you know when people say that, some people say that it's wrong to say this, it's not wrong. That one of the reasons why Muslims fast is that because we want to feel how poor people feel. So some people say, no, no, where is that in Islam? It's part of this muasa, this hadith. Part of it is we're trying to feel how they feel. But we don't stop there. The second level of muasat is then we go and alleviate the hardship and help and assist and be kind and generous and do something. That's the second level. So you know this month, Muasar, could be anything. Being in the assistance and help of others in any way, shape or form. Like I said, last week I was in, in another place where I was giving a talk. I gave an example. I said, one of the ways in Ramadan, Muasat, Muasat is showing empathy, compassion. You could just go to your friend and say, you know what, I'll wash your car for you. In Ramadan, it's month of Muasat. You can go to your neighbor Give me your list of groceries. I'm going to Tesco, as the what do you call here? Coop. Coop or whatever. Yeah, I'm going to the superstore. Give me your list. I'm going to buy everything. Just give me in Ramadan. It's a month of muasat. It doesn't have to be monetary charity. Any way, showing empathy, compassion, kindness towards other people. So this is a month of muasat mentioned by the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi. And therefore, definitely not retaliate or not fight or not argue in Ramadan because it goes completely opposite of Muasat. So if someone, to end of this, if some non-Muslim asks, why does, why does a Muslim fast? How would you, in all of this, how would you answer? Give me like four. Why do Muslims fast? Reason number one? Yes. Submission. We fast because connect to Allah and we be submissive is is because of submission because he told us not to eat so we don't eat when he says eat we'll eat that's one reason why Muslims fast number two to get and that's there all of that the reward is there 
The second reason, in, based on what I've just explained everything. Practice sabr. Yes. Practice sabr. But how would you say that to a non-Muslim? Because they won't know what sabr means. You will say, we Muslims fast so that we go against our urges and our desires, our new natural human needs and you know, our desire, urges to do things which are wrong and bad. So we get a practice that after Ramadan, we don't do that. Third reason. Yeah, that's part of that second one, willpower, strong character, internal, and you know, sabr, all of that second one's done. Third reason, right at the end I mentioned, feel how the poor people feel and you know, experience their poverty and because that's from those muasat. Okay? That's and there's another one? Yeah, but that's part of the, the fourth one as well. But anyway, so to summarize, now it's your time. To summarize, what did I say in the beginning? Right in the beginning. Right in the beginning, I mentioned this is a month that is the month because we need to take away things with us. It's not just a lecture for the sake of lecture and enjoying. This is a month Ramadan. Allah gave us this month. Why? Yeah. Every remember I said there were two extremes. You have some people who just divorce the world and detach from the world and completely you can't be godly, you can't be close to God. Unless you just don't eat and don't drink and don't marry, don't have children, don't have family, don't work, don't nothing. So Islam says, no, live in this world. But when you go too far away, every so often when you're going far away from Allah, come back to Allah. So we have daily reminders in the form of five-time prayers and du'as. We have weekly reminders like Jumu'ah. And we have monthly reminders like you know, the three days fasting. Whatever. And a yearly main reminder is Ramadan to connect to Allah. Then I explained, how do you connect to Allah through Ramadan? I explained through fasting, how we connect to Allah. Through Quran recitation, how we connect to Allah. Submission, fasting with submission. With submission. Quran with khushu, salah with khushu. Uh, i'tikaf, completely connecting to Allah. And lastly, charity, because it's the creation of Allah that Allah loves and we love the creation, so Allah loves us. So that's how you connect. And then at the end I mentioned that the Messenger وسلم, mentioned this month, introduced it as a month of sabr, patience. Sabar is creating a willpower to be able to control ourselves, to do things which we don't want to do, such as pray, etc., and stay away from sins. And he also called this the month of muasat, which is compassion, empathy, feeling like the poor people, and feeling sadness, and then trying to alleviate their sadness and help and assist other people, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. We'll end with this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.